This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. Please remain calm. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad. And I'm here to talk to you about this specific episode. And the reason I am doing that is because there's a lot of confusion around this episode. It really wasn't the first one, but this is now the the first one in our podcast series. And the reason I am re-recording this, excuse me, is because of a lot of confusion. When people come to look at the back catalog of what we've recorded before, they'll eventually get to this first episode. And to explain how this podcast began, it was started because I was writing a humorous book about narcissism. And it's an odd book. I'm still editing it. Maybe by the time you're listening to this, I would have finished this book. But I was looking to create a podcast as a companion to that book, a very odd book on narcissism. And the character that starred in this book, his name was Chad the Impaler, which is why throughout the beginning of all of my podcasts, you will hear the name or me, you, the name I use would be Chad the Impaler. Eventually, we moved out of that. So this first podcast that you'll be listening to here was at the beginning uh, a companion. So we were trying to take the, the character from the book and create a world that just extended from it. And the episode didn't work. It was half bad humor and half seriousness. And the seriousness, I didn't mean to happen. It just kind of evolved as I started talking. And and the other part of me came out, the, the person that has empathy. Not that my character doesn't have empathy, just an actual serious tone came from this episode. And so a lot of things are said in this episode, which some people have been taking seriously because they haven't realized it was part of an actual book and uh, from a specific character in the book that I was trying to play, but I'm not that good of an actor and I couldn't keep up what was going on. So if for all of you out there who will listen to this and are, have been offended by my Germany comments, please do not be offended. I like Germany. I've been to Germany. I loved Berlin. I had a great time when I was there. Uh, I have no problem with German people. So for the emails that I've been getting from people, I just want to say that this wasn't the intention. I didn't mean to offend you. I also don't want to take apart this episode because in a way, I like the idea that this episode existed to show the happenstance of what happened with this podcast where it started out as one thing with one intention and it became this happy accident where I started to interview people that grew up in dysfunctional homes like I did and I found a community and a way to talk to people and heal with people as I began talking and it's been a blessing to be a part of this so I just wanted to explain to everyone who is, has now come all the way back to listen to this, what you're about to hear. So that's all I have to say about that, really. Anyway, enough with me. I'm going to get out of my own way here and let you listen to this odd episode. Welcome to the Narcissist Combat Army podcast. I am your fearless leader, Chad the Impaler. Usually with me is my trusty sidekick, Dr. Jonas Vaughn. But Dr. Vaughn this week is at an anti narcissist conference in Germany. I wish him safe travels. You know, Germany, not the greatest place in the world, not the most fun, has a terrible history, a narcissist history. I wish Dr. Jonas Vaughn the best. You know, there's something about Germany 
that I couldn't help but notice when thinking about it earlier today. Is there one comedian you know that ever came from Germany? None. Do they even know how to laugh? No. Don't trust them. Narcissists. Terrible people. I hope Dr. Jonas Vaughn comes back in one piece. Maybe one day he'll actually be on the show. He is part of our anti-narcissist campaign. And just so everyone remembers, the Narcissist Army Combat Training Program, free of charge. Free of charge, everyone. Join our program. It's a two-year program, and then you have to be in the Army for two years once the war starts, the Great War. The Narcissist Apocalypse is upon us. That's all I have to say about that. But also, if you are a narcissist or have a loved one that is a narcissist, we have Narcon, the the Narcissist Conversion Camp. That is a $4,000 program. It's a three-day program. If you have a loved one you want to convert back to being a normal person, a.k.a. a normie, send them to that camp. It's a great camp. We have a very high conversion rate. You won't be sorry. It's only $4,000. If you're a narcissist and you want to become a normal person again and you don't have the money, go to GoFundMe or a Kickstarter of some sort. Raise the money. Find someone to sponsor you. You won't regret it. Anyway, before we get into our guest today, I just want to discuss a piece of news. You know, narcissists in the news. Narcissists in the news. I don't know if you read about Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, you know, the, one of these tech billionaires who runs the world, Amazon.com, owns the Washington Post. Everyone thinks, you know, that nerds aren't narcissists. Let me tell you, they might be the biggest ones. This guy has destroyed the mom and pop shop. He's destroyed everyone's lives. He doesn't care. He runs that business at a loss. And now everyone's shocked that he cheated on his wife and did this or did that. Classic narcissist. Finally made money. Do you see what he looked like before he made his money? Classic nerd. Classic. I got nothing against nerds. I am one. I am one. But I'm a good one. Like all you people out there, we're good. Inherently good people. Well, at least the ones that are listening to this, unless you are a narcissist and you're trying to learn about what we're doing at the upcoming war... Anyway, I digress. This week on our show, we have Melissa, an old, 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 old friend of mine, Melissa, a wonderful human being and a narcissist abuse survivor. And today she is on our show. We are going to discuss her past, her present and her narcissist-free future. She is a lieutenant in her program and one hell of an instructor. She can turn anyone into a warrior, a narcissist warrior who loves themselves. She's a great listener, a great person, a great friend. And you know what? She also loves animals to death, loves the cats, (laughs) loves cats. And uh, I'm really excited to have her on our show because sometimes in life you need a, a friend that will be there for you through thick and through thin. And uh, I'm that friend to her. And she's that friend to me. And these are the people we want in our lives, everyone. And we're going to learn a lot from her today and her tragic story. Her tragic, tragic story of being involved with Someone who couldn't give a rat's butt about her. And without further ado, everyone, here we go. Welcome to the show, Melissa. How are you? (laughs) I'm good. I'm good. That's quite the intro. Uh, I think it's an appropriate intro. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you're welcome. So, you know, before before we started recording, mm-hmm. you were discussing 
how you were on uh, the, you were on the bus today yes. and and how all of these old feelings and memories and wounds just opened wide and someone just shoved their hand in and ripped your heart out and then punched it into a million pieces and then they drank all your blood and <laughs> things like that this is not a laughing matter. To, I don't mean to laugh. This is I not just, a laughing matter. Yeah. Tell tell us what happened today. Um, and tell okay. us about your tell us your story for everyone. Oh. They, everyone wants to hear it. Everyone. <laughs> okay, I'm not I don't mean to laugh. I'm just nervous. Okay, so hmm. I was on the bus and every time I come back into the city, I'm reminded of the life that I left in the city, which was one that uh, lasted almost 10 years and was very tumultuous with one particular person. And every time I come back, I think about what I left, but also, I guess, what I've gained. It's sort of complicated because I realize that I'm in a new place when I come back here. But usually I think about a part of me that is gone and that's what makes me the most sad because I realize that you know Toronto is this like very exciting place like not to put a pin on exactly (laughs) what we're talking about but um I used to feel so excited coming here and now it's like this sort of tainted memory because it's like all the things that I was were sort of washed with something that was just terrible. It, like, made me not myself. So um, I don't know if that makes sense. It's just, like, I, 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 I'm I revisiting a memory of myself that I would care not to um, because I'm not the self that I'd like to be when I come back here sometimes. Is it, like, a form of narcissist PTSD? Um, yeah, that seems appropriate. I think that I enjoy things so much more now because I'm not with somebody that made me so miserable. So, like, when I come back here, it's like, oh, but these places are so beautiful and magical and, like, it's such a great city. But to me, I'm kind of like... Meh, like I don't really want to be here just because everything is re- like so reminiscent of like bad times. So this the city triggers you. It does. It's like a trigger warning. Like as soon as I see those fucking billboards, I'm just like, oh man, like I I don't I don't feel good because I it was my city when I moved there and then when I left, it was no longer my city. Like I don't mean that like really garbagey. Like that's how, that sounds terrible. Oh no! Everywhere you everywhere you look, you have a reminder yeah. of, of, of pain. Well, and like when I first went there, it represented everything that was so exciting, and like it just there were like the possibilities were endless, and there was like friends and art and everything. And then when I left. Oh, I remember when you left. Yeah, well, it was just, like, so bad. It was so bad. So just so you know, when Melissa here left the city, she was in a rough state. Rough. Very, very Very, rough. Very rough. Yeah. You know, we had phone calls a lot. Uh, I won't go into real detail, but... um, Chad had to call me every Wednesday because I couldn't... Deal. Couldn't, couldn't deal. Couldn't deal. I couldn't deal. Couldn't deal. Couldn't deal. You know, and that's the type of people we are on this podcast. We like to help people not deal by dealing and keep each other accountable when they're in the throes of narcissist abuse, PTSD, depression, anxiety. It happens. And do you know what? She got back on her feet. But Chad, I'd like to ask you this. Oh, Have yes. you been the survivor of PTSD. You know the answer you, you know the answer to that. I think I do, but Of course you do. You've been through th- th- through thinking No, but I just I'm curious. Every, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, well every day. Yeah. But uh, um, with f- from fa- from family? Yeah. Yeah. 
from birth. Yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, I was know, thinking about one person in particular. Oh, 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 oh yeah, oh but yeah, that, that thing. You know what? You're yeah. right. You know that. I, I don't want to talk about. Ever. I don't want to talk about that person right now. <laughs> now you're triggering me really hard. <laughs> well, and let's not ever you're forget that our family. Trigger. <laughs> our family can be the biggest um, triggers of all time, right? Like they can oh, well, be I the was, bigger. I was born into a coven of narcissists. I don't know if yeah. you remember that. No, I do know that. That's true. You know, left, right, and center, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey there, Chad. You're looking pretty fat today. (laughs) Yeah, like, let's project all of our shit onto Chad because, like, he's the easiest target. Oh, Chad's smiling and having a great day. Like, let's make him feel like... Yeah. Like, today is is not a good day for Chad. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Why why would he think that? Why would he possibly think that? I don't know. (laughs) So... En- enough of th- this podcast today is about you. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. So, you you were on the bus. I was on the bus. Yeah, and, yeah. You, and you had all of these crazy, overwhelming feelings. No, they weren't actually. Oh, they weren't overwhelming? No, but every other time, I would say, like. Were you angry? No, I was more like I am not feeling it's like it's like you know when you have to reassert your feelings to a certain like towards a certain place because you don't want them to be associated with negativity oh, anymore. Yeah. I, it took it's me- like you want to take the power back. Oh yeah. You you can't possibly like let Trust me, I don't go to certain neighborhoods anymore. <laughs> right. But, but you don't want that to be the case. Like, those neighborhoods aren't inherently bad. Um, it's just the, the, the paint in which you wash them with is bad. Like, that's because of your, your memory. And you don't want memory to be so powerful over you. Part of it is memory. For me, about a specifics for a specific neighborhoods around here. For sure. Uh, but part of it is that area to me uh, that I don't go to on not on purpose. I have no reason to go there. Uh, you know, I I I don't drink. I don't. In that area is more known for that kind of lifestyle. So for me, that just repels me because I'm. Uh, sober and uh, for me being around that party ish lifestyle doesn't appeal to me and actually makes me uh, put my hands up like a shield if I was to walk near it like I don't do it like in in reality like but like in my mind that's kind of what happens and it's more uh, less about a specific person now and more about that lifestyle in general and um, knowing that uh, I had no future there, that that lifestyle wanted me to stay down. And it's like, I'm it's a, like a garbage dump. It's, and, like, a, it's, yeah, like, a, it's and, like a ditch. Yeah, it's like, like it, it had not... no smell, but it, it's, I could smell it. Yeah, and yeah. in my reality, I wanted I, to be the best for the narcissist apocalypse, for when the Great War happens. I need to be in the best shape possible. That's true. I don't need, you know, those people on my team. Yeah, that's true. I started a new team. Yeah. And this new team is great. It is super awesome. (laughs) And you're in it. I don't know if I would be allowed in it. I might be. you, You are in it. Okay, I'm in it. Yes, you know what? I'm in it. I just sometimes I have feelings about, um... You know. that, that you might not be worthy. Well, yeah. Well, everyone, everyone, sure. ha- everyone has yeah. that. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'll have a day where I wake up and I'm like, "Oh, Chad, today you don't have it today." But do right. you know what? I of look course. up and I look into the eyes of everyone who's out there counting on me. Yeah. And I say, "Fuck it, I'm the man." Fucking today, all these people are looking at me to lead them. I'm either going to lead them. Or I'm not. And there's only one way in life for me right now, and that's to destroy all the narcissists, to kill Mark Zuckerberg. 
to kill them all yeah. and take back Earth, really. That's it. That's my story. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a... Would you call it a pandemic or an epidemic? Pandemic is one of my favorite games right now to play at Snakes and Lattes. <laughs> and okay, uh, that's a more of a race. That's a race against time uh, type of game. I don't know if you've ever played Pandemic. No, Great, game. I haven't. Great game. Can you tell me like the actual like difference between epidemic and pandemic? Those two words. One starts with a P and one starts no. with an E. One is epidemiology and one is something else. Why are we fussing? <laughs> I thought you would have the answer. I don't have the answer to everything. I have the answer to most things. Okay, okay, okay. So how do you play pandemic? Tell me. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about that right oh, now. Oh, okay, okay. I want to talk about. Yeah, ask me the next question about. Oh, I just want to know. Let's talk about like where all this began and where all, all what began. All all of your narcissist problems. Oh, okay, okay. You know that was um, that. Was, you know that's why you're on here. I like to talk about. <laughs> You're narcissist. That's a very good question. I don't know. Like, how do you attract a narcissist? Like, that's the question. Well, how do you is, how is, do you enter into when the did you, dance? When, when did you realize? Let's just start this way. When did you realize? Okay, can I tell you something real right here? Yeah, we are like talking real. very late. But when I look back, yeah, I was so like, when you're talking I late. Was, so you, you, it was a ten year relationship. What what year? Year seven. We're just gonna say like twenty to thirty. Just like it sums it up nicely. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So like what twenty? I was twenty. Yeah, and and then it stops when I was thirty. Yeah. So in there, there was one. You know what? It's so weird, but I remember one instance where I thought this is like very personal, but. That's what we do on this show. Like, any time I ever felt afraid, that person was like, shrug shoulders, kind of like, I don't know what to tell you. And it would be like, but what if I'm like pregnant or something? Or like, it was always like something like actually kind of serious, especially considering I was 20 years old. I remember racing into a pharmacy on Roncesvalles because I thought that, like, I was like, I can't be pregnant. Something happened, and it was like, I was a kid. I was a fucking kid. And, like, I remember him just being, like, absent. And it was like, that should have been a red flag, but I just didn't know. And then there was, like, so many other red flags. Like, I got pregnant and then I had to have an abortion and he wasn't there. And then I was like home and depressed and not knowing what to feel. And he was like, wasn't there. It was like, I don't know what to do this. Like, it wasn't even like this sucks. It was like, not even that. And it was just like all of these disqualifying events. He just was like playing video games. Maybe, but that's kind of like a trope in and of itself. Like, not even. It was just like the dismissiveness that occurred. Like, playing video games is almost like a compliment. It was like, at least you're doing, like, sometimes you would just sit there and, like, not even know what to do. And that was even more harsh. It was just like, can you just, but I didn't know. And, like, I don't know if you know what it feels like to, like, not have a boyfriend that, like, even acknowledges, like, you as a like, emotional human being. It's just, like, you feel like... I do and I don't. I do in the, <laughs> sure. sen I do in the sense of, like, um, the person did acknowledge it, but at the same time, they faked it. Right. Yeah. At least he did he fake he didn't fake anything. No, he was he, 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 he was, didn't have the decency to fake anything. <laughs> he didn't give a shit and he wouldn't hide it and he thought I think at the time to be honest with you so he was a that straight, I was he, he so was, naive, I was so good-natured. I didn't want to believe anything bad about anyone. I really really didn't. And he took advantage of that at the time. Then I got more jaded, but at the time, yeah, I wasn't a perfect human being, 
but I'd already admitted to the things that I lacked in myself, and he took advantage of those things. He'd throw so it back in your face? Well, it's like I told him when I was very young. It was like, look, I've dealt with this, 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 and this in my life. And he wasn't cool about it. It was like, oh, oh, your parents divorced. Like, oh, oh, but like, that's, you know, it was like, that's okay. And it, was, it wasn't like, nothing was an empathetic response. And I don't know if I'm being like way too candid. Right? Like, this is very vulnerable stuff, but I'm trying to be really honest. So anything I ever told him was a liability, but I just didn't know it at the time. And it was like, nothing nothing was in confidence but at the time i didn't realize it because i would give those things up to people without realizing that there may be a consequence i just trusted people and it was sort of like he was the one person that i thought i could trust the most and he betrayed it all but in in very small increments that I didn't notice until it was too late. You know what I mean? It's like it was way too late. Uh, do you think that his narcissistic tendencies were something he was conscious of or something that he just didn't, he had no clue? Um, I think in the beginning he didn't know. He was trying to be somewhat himself. But then... I don't know. I think you could argue that he was being very um, calculated, but oh, but, oh. but but without meaning to be. Like he was he was calculated in the sense that like he wanted to date me and my friends, and I was like, no, I didn't get a good vibe. I was like, I. And then once he got you in. And you're like, oh, this guy's impressive. He knows a lot about... I, w- I wasn't even really impressed. I just thought that... Um, I see where you're going, though. It's like all my friends were like, this guy's really sweet. But I didn't see that. They saw that. They, sorry. They saw him... To, they, they saw him as being a sweet person. They saw Oscar <laughs> as being like... <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. And whoops. Did I just, <laughs> anyway, it was just like. Yeah, because when I think of said person whose name you shouldn't have used, whose name. Whatever. Um, I don't think of sweet in Nobody any. Nobody does. In, but in, they in, did. In at any the time. of my interactions. Never. Never. And. Um, yeah, sweet is not the, like, empathetic would not be, critical. He surprised me <laughs> on my birthday. He had a cake made out of cupcakes. And my friends, he, he here's one for you. Manipulative is a, is a very good um, term for this, I think, looking back. Because I didn't, I was like, no. He was like, I invited you to go see Radiohead and you declined me. And I was like, yeah, I did. Like, I didn't want to go out with you. And then he got into, like, the psyche of my roommates. And I got home from work one day and he had made me a cake made out of cupcakes. And then they were all like, oh, my God. Like, like, can you believe he did this? And I was just like, okay, cool. Like, I guess you guys are all right. Because all my friends were saying, like, go for it. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I'm not a perfect person. You know, leading this army, I I will tell you my flaws. And one of my flaws is sometimes you have to flirt with narcissism to know that you have to pull yourself back. And a long time ago, before I was well, before I uh, did a lot of introspection... I once was this person in a way where I would do all these things in a, in a calculated way, not realizing it. And then once you got the person. You didn't want them. Not that you didn't want them. You're like, oh, I don't want to do anything. 
you know, that was kind of, you got, it was just, you kind of then went with the motions, except I was not, I wouldn't be in a relationship with that person for 10 years. Quickly after I'm like, right. why did you do that? That's fine. Why did you That's do that? Fine. Because you made that person feel this type of way. And but that's na- a natural human thing that we do. You don't prolong it for years. That's different. I prolonged and- it for I prolonged it for a year. But I was able to see that. I, I felt that extreme guilt about it. I think that's actually a very common thing. It's like we all manipulate each other to a certain degree. That's not new, but when there's a power structure in a relationship that's abusive, that's different. And yeah. when it and when it starts, when it's like seated in like a very, very, um, I don't know, like it's just like it's it's very insidious. That's different. But I know what you're saying. I, I understand. That's like we the are, first... We're all manipulative. Look, I've been manipulative too. There, nobody is um, free from that, from that distinction. I really don't think so. I really don't. Everyone that I know has done something that's been somewhat controlling in relationship with another person. That's not something that makes you narcissistic per se. I think you're teetering on the edge. Well, but I don't know because like I was honest with you at the beginning, like I don't know if the person that I was with was narcissistic oh, they or, were. Whether oh, they we, were. or whether we were just in a very toxic relationship. Oh no, that person was a narcissist. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I really want him to believe. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think I, so. I, I think so. Like, look, I'll, think, like remember, I'll remember, tell remember, stuff to, to, to my current partner, and he's like, that makes me so... Like, I can't even imagine him being like that. It's, like, so basic, like, the basic human needs. One, like, of, my, one of my favorite conversations. We were going... My, uh, Melissa and I were going swimming one day, or we intended to go swimming one day. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's and right. I said, how come your partner doesn't want to come? And his response was, why would you want to go swimming? Why wouldn't you just want to stay at home? And yeah. like, you know, in a very dismissive, like, we're dumb for going swimming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everything was dumb. Everything that was dumb that wasn't League of Legends. That was dumb. And it was like, excuse me. It was like 30 degrees. Can I? It was like, can I? It was like 30, yeah, it was ridiculous. So 30 ridiculous. degrees Celsius, like 95 degrees Fahrenheit and outside. You know, and you know what? Where I thought, like, fuck you. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. I can't. I can't give a shit. Like, And you can't. And uh, so this whole entire episode today that brought you back, you're here, you're in the city, you're reflecting on th- your narcissistic abuse uh, you know we won't go now back further than we have to we are we already know what's been going on yeah uh, where are you going from here um, how, what 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 is how are you dealing with this uh how are you going to cope uh in the future do you have like coping mechanisms that you're going to deal with are you going to come question. back here um i don't know it's like it is a good question because it is a good question i know my shit I got a program. You do. And you do. everyone who is out there right now, if you're just tuning in for some reason halfway through the show, it happens. Join the Narcissist Army today. You know, again, to your program, free room and board. If you're re- doing really well and one of our top students, you don't get, just get to be on a bunk bed. You get a racing car bed. It's a great time. You get a lot of people, uh, smart people, fun, empathetic people working there. Helping you, training you. Again, if you are a narcissist or know a narcissist, you want them to be converted back into a regular person. We have Narcon, $4,000 for three days. A great program, high conversion rate. You won't be sorry. Anyway, sorry for that interlude. We have to sometimes do this. We have to sell our program for the narcissist apocalypse, but now that is over. Back to Melissa. Tell us everything. What are you going to do? How are you going to improve? 
How are you going to be a better person? Where do you go from here? Is it okay to have two steps forward and three steps back, two steps forward, five steps back, but as long as you keep on going forward, tell me everything. Go. <laughs> um, okay. So how do you go forward? Um, I think you have to surround yourself with people that are just honor you for who you are. You can't, you, you, you just develop a code of ethics that are, that is so, it's so linear. It's so just like you, you take no shit from anyone because you realize I'm like, maybe, you know, other people haven't had the fallout that I had, but when you realize that you've dealt with somebody that is so almost psychopathic in their interactions with you, then you realize that you will never, ever, you know, have those relationships again. And the slightest inclination of narcissism will repel you and you will avoid it. Or even with the people that you love the most, you just won't tolerate small. That's not to say that you 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 won't be patient with those that you love because they might have their moments, right? But you'll be much more skeptical and... You're not going to have the mentality, I can fix this person. No, you will never... And I never had that, to be oh, honest you with that? you. Yeah. But it developed over time through manipulation. So you're going to develop like a like an awareness of like, why am I attracted to this person? Is this person somebody like you are right about that. I've definitely had friendships that have felt like that. Say that again. What was I? <laughs> You're right about That's that. That's right. That, I'm right about Very a lot right. of stuff. Very right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So back to the question. Um, how are you moving forward? How am I moving forward? My job and my relationship are very, they're very much rooted in like what's real and genuine. Nothing is, is something that I feel that I have to work at. Before I was like very obsessed about social media and stuff that I didn't actually care about at all. What do you mean you were obsessed with social media? Because, because I, we are so anti-social media around here. We are. Yeah. We are. I don't it, like it at all. Yeah, but, because but I felt that Earth. I had to keep up in a way. Whereas now I'm just like, I could give a shit. I don't really care. And I think that yeah, one of our soldiers now controls our account because I don't want to be near it. Okay. There you go. Yeah. I respect that. I yeah. do. I think that like, and, I mean, I work with children and then I have a somebody that I'm like with that is very loving and empathetic and is very real. So it's like when you surround yourself with things that are very real and grounded, you won't, you won't feel the weight of, you know, maybe what you've dealt with before. And just it's so like everyone you're knows, healing, you're it, healing. And you're, just so everyone knows that person, uh, is the actual chef at our program. It makes delicious, uh, healthy, nutritious meals for everyone. Yes, he does. Yeah. And, he does. uh, I won't go more to that. Sorry. I interrupted and that was very rude of me. No, and I'll continue no, no. Cause, it's, it's a very cause, important. Cause I, no, because it was wrong of me. I've lost track of what you were talking about. And did you lose track? No, okay, good, no, good, no. Good. I was just saying that you need the time and space to heal. And the way to do that is through human interaction and human interaction that is real and for me, that's children and families. That's like the realest interaction that I could possibly have. And that's, that makes me so much happier. And it's when you realize that the person, not when you realize, but when you are sort of acknowledged within your family and your partnership, that that's something that's actually very, very much part of who you are and they acknowledge that and they like they 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 make that something that you feel grat like gratitude for does that make sense like yeah. then you feel good 
It's like when you don't have somebody that makes you, that acknowledges that for you, not that you need it acknowledged by someone else, but it certainly helps oh, yeah. to make you feel that you're doing what is right. You know, you can do things for yourself and, and that's wonderful. But if the person that you're with also acknowledges that what you're doing is very, very much in line with who you are, then you will be that much more grateful for your identity and like what you're doing and everything. I know it works every day. It does. Yeah. Like you need people to sort of solidify your identity in that way. It sounds strange. Like it's like I know who I am, but for so many years I lost that. I would see myself in relationship to another person and that person never understood who I was and would always like desecrate my humanity in some type of way that made me feel like, well, maybe I am a bad person. And then I started to believe that I was a bad person. And then that just snowballed. But I always knew that what I was doing in my career was like, was good. And, and it somehow got tainted. And then when you all of a sudden align yourself with people that get you, then it's like, oh, I'm back to who I actually am. Yeah. I remember our Wednesday phone calls, which I, I, I miss our Wednesday yes. phone calls. And those I remember in a lot of time on those early Wednesday phone calls, maybe these phone calls would last an hour, an hour and a half. And maybe like three or four times during the phone call, you would be like, am I a bad person? And you would, and you would say it often. And I'd have to reinforce, you're not a bad I person. I still feel that sometimes. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. Oh. For sure. Over that situation specifically or? Yeah, just like bad feelings. Like just. You just think of it and it goes, you know, to darkness. Yeah. Yeah. What happens in the darkness? Does what happens in the darkness stay in the darkness? No, mm-hmm. it kind of creeps out. Yeah, yeah. it creeps. <laughs> For sure. Uh, does it, so you find yourself in this better place, but you do occasionally like today find yourself pulled back here and there. Uh, is there a specific trigger that happens, like not here, but when you're in your uh, new town? Is there something that happens or, no. or, or, or just a flashback? When I'm there, of it's a totally new life, right? Like when I'm here, it's like I had two lives. It's like I had the life in Toronto versus the life in Hamilton. So like when I come back here, it's like my adulthood. It's like my early adulthood. Like that gets, that's what's triggered because now I have a whole like other life. Do you thing. think it, it will take time? For it to heal? Yeah. You think yeah. you'll one day be able to come here? And because, yeah. I don't know, if, like, maybe we discuss this off mic, but not that anything happens off mic. <laughs> that when you got into town today, that specific person actually texted you. Yeah. yeah. And that narcissist that we both loathe, you loathe. Because you loathe that person, I loathe that person because you loathe that person. And it was like cosmic that that person didn't know you were in the, in the city. No. And as soon as you walked in, boom. Yeah, right? Hello. Punch in the gut. And it was like a picture of my cat. And it's like the one thing that would always solve problems was our cats. By not talking about anything, just yes. being like, oh, it what's going like, on with our cats at, today? But look at her, like, look at her. And it was like, I'd be like crying and it would be like, okay, like maybe I'll be okay because you're deflecting everything. And it just like, it all made sense why he did that. It's like if you had kids and you're just like, look at our kid. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's like, I didn't respond. But then I had moments of like, maybe I should respond, but you just can't respond. It's like, if you're ever considering whether to do something or not, you just don't, right? Like, that's the rule. It's like, if you're ever like wishy-washy, it's like, just don't do it. Like, that's what they tell you. Like, just don't do it. And so I didn't do anything, but I felt like I should, I had like all these thoughts in my head of like, what if I responded? Because I wanted to, and this is like the fourth or fifth message he sent me that I haven't responded to oh. over like a year. So, 
how do, uh, does that make you feel guilty that you do it not? It makes me feel good. Because I'm don't. like, fuck you. You still, like, good for you for, like, it's so convoluted. Have you it's ever? It's like that- I want, I, I feel good in a sense, but then I feel pathetic. You feel so many things wrapped up into one because you're like, so you think you can text me and I'll respond? And that makes you angry. But then you're like, I love that you think, like, I, I'm happy that you text me and I get to not respond. That makes me feel powerful. But I also think that it's sad because it's like I do share so many things with you and I want to respond on, like, a human level. That makes me feel sad. There's so many things wrapped up into it that just make you feel so fucking bummed out. That's just like, why did you have to be such a terrible person to me? Because technically, you know, that is... Like, it didn't it is, have it, to it, end this way. Like, was, I would have been with you forever, and that might have been terrible, but, like, I was willing to do it. Like, that's what pisses you off, because you're just like, how could you be that much of an asshole that, like, you actually just... It's so bad because you know you're with somebody else and you don't want to be with anybody except that person, but you realize that you gave the last person the best shot they ever had. And it's like so fucking maddening that they would that that there's ever anything that's going to be there for you guys in the in the ether. It's like I don't want anything to do with you ever again. It's like either I do because there's like I can be your friend or something or like just never, ever talk to me again because there's always going to be that thought in your mind of like I tried so fucking hard and and I wasted years of my life and I hate that I feel that way because that's like a feeling of regret and people are like never regret and never – but you do like, how could you not? It's, it's inevitable that, you, you know, I've been there. Of course, you, you know, I like, let's I was not, so young. I was a young yeah, person. And it was one third at your time. It was one third of your life. It's now a little less, a little yeah, less than that, but it was one third of your life. I, terrible. you know, in my own experience, Yes, I will talk about myself because I love talking <laughs> about myself. And Melissa has talked about herself a I lot. I did, I did, I did. I really did. Jack. No, but in my, I'm just sharing my experience with you. In my experience with a specific individual, I eventually felt guilt and shame that I went, I would, so in the history of narcissists and narcissism and different types of, people and where you fit in in grand schemes of their evil plans. Uh, There's a specific, you know, type of narcissist that has lackeys and the lackey goes along with whatever the narcissist kind of does there. I consider them a follower. And in a way I had grown into this follower part where this person would be, wouldn't outwardly be terrible to me. Little did I know, behind my back, this person was not the greatest to me. And by not the greatest, I mean, what a fucking piece of work. Shit. Fuck that person was. But in the reality, I would go along while that person was doing things to other people. And I wouldn't say anything or or reprimand them. I just go along and just watch it and let it happen. And then if, you know, I thought I was being a loyal person. And when I would, someone would ask me something, I would be loyal instead of, you know, being honest to this other person that whatever was going on, because my loyalty was in, in one spot and the other person made you feel so good sometimes, but that was their trick. Cause in reality, they were waiting for the moment to, um, once they had enough of feasting on you, you know, they were ready to unleash all of the things that they've been secretly thinking the whole entire time. And then your whole world comes crashing down. And then you're like, wow, w- what a piece of work I was. I-, I went along with this forever. 
and this and this, and then you start feeling like, wow, I can't believe I did that. I went along, ugh. And then you just have shame and you think terrible things of yourself. And it takes you a while to wrap your brain around what has actually happened. But when you finally do, and then you avoid <laughs> going wherever you're going, and you reset yourself and you sit inside and be like, no one talk to me. I'm not being a narcissist by not going to your bar mitzvah party or your, 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 your birth of your child or this, that. I need to reset and then you reset, and then you come back, and you'd be like, ah, oh, no, no, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then you start finding your niche again and your way in life, and then you start creating an army of people like you because you don't want other people to go through things like you did, and then you don't, the people that did, you want to make them feel better, mm-hmm. and you want them to fight back because we're here for a fight. I'm ready for a fight, you know. Sometimes yes. in life, people need to be punched in the face. And I've been punched in the face all the time. And now I'm ready to punch back. And I think you are too. Yes. That's why you're a lieutenant in the army. <laughs> That's why we have the greatest narcissist army yes. in the world, anti-narcissist yes. army. We're going to kick major butt when the apocalypse happens. We're going to kill Mark Zuckerberg. And we want everyone who's listening to join our army today. Join, sign up on our website. Sign up to our army. The Narcissist Podcast not the Narcissist Podcast, the Narcissist Combat Army. We're going to have a training manual coming out in about a couple months. It's almost um, ready to be uh, distributed. We have a distributor. We'll be doing a, a Kickstarter program. We will be doing, um, you know, we're going to be raising funds. All of these funds will be going to our uh, program. And, you know, I think that's kind of... Maybe we should end it on, on that note, uh, uh, Melissa. Okay. We should end our show right there. You've, you've uh, you know, you, you've talked a lot. You've given us a lot of your experience, which we appreciate. We love you. Everyone loves you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the oh, no, time it was, on, it was wonderful. on air. It was wonderful. On behalf of Melissa, myself, Chad the Impaler, and Dr. Jonas Vaughn, who could not be here, my trusty sidekick, this has been the Narcissist Combat Army Podcast. Good night and Godspeed. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. This is an emergency broadcast transmission. This is not a test. Please remain calm.